God, the master restorer, wants to begin the restoration process with us now. The truth is, there is not one single person in this world who doesn't need restoration. Praise God that our righteousness, our filthy rags, can be removed and replaced with the pure white robe of Christ's righteousness. Amen. You know, there are, really when you think about it, there are so many appropriate descriptions for God, Creator, Savior, the list kind of goes on and on. But today we're going to focus on one that it somehow doesn't always seem to register on our radar screen, Restorer, Restorer. You know, if you've ever seen what an accomplished human Restorer can do, you will begin to get the faintest, tiniest glimpse of this very, very important aspect of who God is. That expert furniture restorer. You know, they, they, don't, they don't see what we see. We see a, a broken, stained, scarred piece of furniture of which the only purpose seems to be to just collect dust while it sits ignored on the driveway of someone's garage sale. No, the, the trained eye of that expert restorer can already see this furniture as it will be, fully restored in both beauty and functionality, patient and thorough rebuilding of the broken structure will have by then rendered it strong and once more useful, meticulous and, and cautious refinishing will have by then removed the scars and and remove the stains, leaving it once again a, a beautiful piece of furniture. One doesn't usually have to search for long to find old, abandoned automobiles, right? It seems like every small town in America has plenty of them. Their once smooth, aerodynamic lines now, now bent and rumpled. Their mirror-like painted exterior ravaged and pitted by the rust of time. The oxidation of abandonment and neglect has eaten away both paint and metal like a cancer. But I'm sure you've also seen examples of how that very same vehicle can be amazingly transformed via the painstaking work of an expert. And so what was once just a pile of rusted junk is now a priceless classic, purring like a kitten and garnering wistful stares from every red-blooded gearhead that is lucky enough to see it. God is the master restorer. Amen. You see, He doesn't see the rust of relationship wounds. He doesn't see the rumpled fenders of divorce. He doesn't see the marred and stained finish which is the result of harmful addictions. He sees each one of us as the perfect, created in His image, masterpiece that we will be when He has completed His loving process of restoration. So for some reasons, in, in thinking about restoration, it's always easier when we, when, we, when we think of it just to focus on the physical, right? We, we think of the, the broken fenders and all of that. For example, we, we tend to longingly visualize a heaven where lions can lie down with lambs, where thorns are no, are no longer a, a painful part of a rose bush. But do we take the time to fully realize that heaven will be 100% devoid of crippling insecurities? destructive jealousies, anxiety compulsions, abandonment fears, post-traumatic stress disorders, just to name a few. You see, obviously, none of these emotional handicaps 
existed before sin, but now, but now they, they're an also present affliction in our lives and in the lives of those we love. If we reread what Mark read for us, the scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54, just to reread that, it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now this scripture makes it totally clear that the trumpet call on the resurrection morning will welcome God's faithful to immortality and perfection. But there is something that I hope you will both listen to and and fully understand. Even with that wonderful day in mind, and I know that we're all looking forward to it, we're praying for it, God the Master Restorer wants to begin the restoration process with us now. Did you get that? So we don't have to just look ahead to that glorious morning. We can understand that God wants to restore us right now. Yeah, the, that's going to be perfect, right? It's going to be perfectly, wonderfully completed then. But he wants to start it now. He knows that emotionally wounded and damaged people only wound and damaged, damage others. You've probably all heard that truism, hurt people, hurt people. Have you heard that? It's very true. You see, left unrestored, we pass our pain and our dysfunction all too easily to those around us. Now, I'm sure that you have all heard this little saying, God loves us just the way we are, but he also loves us too much to leave us just the way we are. You heard that? Well, in John 10.10, 10, Jesus explains that I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Restoration is, in great measure, how we can hope to achieve that satisfying life that God intended us to have. It is also His design that we... Now, I want you to listen to this part. It's His design that we be agents of restoration instead of agents of wounding. His desire is that we will thus promote healing and not brokenness. In other words, he wants us to spread the good news of restoration. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen something, <clears throat> perhaps a television news story or something like that, which was so horrifying that it caused you to, to actually gasp and, and maybe even stop breathing just for a moment? Now, this is really going to date me. I know I do this all the time. I'm, I date myself. But I was in grade school in 1963. You don't need to do the math. <laughs> and I really vividly remember the, the JFK, the JF Kennedy assassination. Anybody else remember that like very vividly? And so for many days surrounding that horrific event, if you remember, the entire nation was just morbidly glued to their television sets as the images and the reports and the speculations, they literally flooded the airwaves constantly. In all of that, I was perhaps most profoundly impacted by the chilling scene of the suspected assassin Lee Harvey Oswald being gunned down on live television. I, I saw it live. Uh, he's being transported from one prison to another. See, the effect of viewing that murder was, I'm sure, amplified by all the rest of the swirling trauma of that whole time. I think you could say that I was pre-traumatized. Well, my friends, when Eve, in her perfect garden home, took that oh-so-fateful bite of that oh-so-forbidden fruit, the entire universe gasped. 
already pre-traumatized by the great war in heaven and the resulting ouster of Lucifer along with one-third of the angelic host, the universe outside of this stricken world audibly gasped. God-fearing, faithful citizens of other perfect created world, worlds, they gasped as they witnessed something so unthinkable, so unexpected, something too horrible to even imagine. You see, at that very moment, in the Garden of Eden, they watched God's perfect creation being broken, being scarred and disfigured and violated. You will not surely die became immediately exposed for the monolithic lie that it was. As Adam and Eve, the very pinnacle of God's creative artistry, began to slowly but surely rust and fade and age. And so they, they sadly watched as the light of light, the lab, sorry, the light of life, so lovingly placed inside of their earthly cousins, started to flicker just a bit, started to grow increasingly dim. Yes, I, I truly believe that these sin-free beings of other worlds have been figuratively, if not literally, holding their collective breaths ever since that fateful day, morbidly glued, as it were, to their galactic television screens, as for thousands of years they have watched the tragic and relentless progression of evil. And I would contend, and I, I admit this is kind of conjecture on my part, but I contend that God, at least until this controversy is finally resolved, is now focused on recreation instead of creation. He's not creating anything right now. He's focused on recreation. And recreation is restoration. In reality, it's just a distinct and specialized facet of his creative work. And the day will surely come, soon, we all hope, when God, the Creator, will create once more. Isn't that going to be awesome? He will once more speak into existence a new world, a new paradise, a new Eden. But in the meantime, since sin must be fully played out for all to see and understand, he contents himself with the creative work of restoration. Does that make sense? In fact, the theme throughout the entire Bible is restoration. After Adam and Eve sinned, God came looking for them in their garden home. Now, just so you know, his purpose wasn't to find out if they had disobeyed him, because he obviously already knew that. His purpose wasn't to condemn them. It wasn't even to lecture them. His purpose, as you can readily understand by reading Genesis 3.15, was to explain and begin the process of restoration. Speaking directly to Satan, who was the serpent, he said, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, Jesus the Savior, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So to greatly paraphrase what God was really saying is this, I have a plan, my children. It's a plan of restoration. There is a painful consequence to your sin, and it, it cannot be avoided. However, I will not abandon you. I will not leave you without hope. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Amen. I will not walk away and simply lose you or this world to this life-extinguishing sin. If you will trust me, if you will trust this plan, even though it must follow a long and arduous process, it will ultimately result in total healing and complete restoration. Amen. And so we see that plan as it relentlessly unfolds in the pages of the Old Testament. On and on it rolls, hundreds of years becoming thousands of years, kind of like an epic Hollywood drama. Greatly outnumbered forces of good fight against a swelling flood of evil. 
back and forth the conflict wages through patriarchs and judges and prophets and kings. A desperate, desperate battle to restore paradise lost. We see the children of Israel as they become the chosen receptacle of God's beneficence and care, the chosen instrument of His plan to bring restoration and salvation to a hopelessly fallen world. Countless times the pages of the Old Testament record this remnant's deplorable and habitual unfaithfulness. One shameful apostasy after another shameful apostasy, while their loving Creator consistently offers forgiveness, promises protection and renewed blessings, and pleads anew for restoration of a once again sin-damaged relationship. And then, and then finally, the real hero of the story arrives on the scene. The seed, or the offspring, of Genesis 3.15. The king, the savior, the restorer. In amazement, all of those extragalactic spectators that are glued to their televisions now realize, perhaps for the very first time, that the restoration plan involves Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, the, the Creator, doing the unimaginable, the unthinkable. They struggle to understand how the Son, who is one with the Father, who is a eternally wrapped in heavenly glory, power, and immortality, would choose to now wrap himself in shame and degradation, weakness and mortality. And they continue to watch in wonder and growing understanding as his earthly ministry becomes a living demonstration of restorative healing. For over three years, they watch as he often pauses to lovingly restore ocular connections for the blind. Nerve impulses and muscle tone to the lame. Skin integrity function and normal appearance to those afflicted with that most dreaded disease of leprosy. And even life itself to those who have fallen asleep. While watching Jesus personally minister to the broken people of this fallen world, these unseen observers of the universe are constantly reminded, as we should be, that the God we serve is a God who loves to physically restore His children. He loves that. He doesn't love to see us hurt and broken. And No. He wants to restore us. But the other huge truth, which can be equally seen in His earthly ministry as well as in His ongoing ministry with all of us, is that Jesus is always, always, always most keenly interested in spiritual and emotional restoration. Isn't that right? How can he sleep through this storm? Doesn't he know that this boat's about to sink and we will all be drowned? Andrew, wake the master up. Jesus, save us. Save us. What? The lake, it's, it's, it's peaceful again. The waves are Come, I, I can see stars. Even the clouds have disappeared. Who is this man? Even the winds and waves obey him? In a singular moment of divine authority, Jesus demonstrates his restorative power. The storms of conflict, the winds of loss and discouragement can often toss us about emotionally, and threaten to sink our healthy balance. Our own strength, our own wisdom, will avail, avail us little more than did the disciples' puny efforts on Lake Galilee that stormy night so many long years ago. Only Jesus can restore the peace and equilibrium that we were created to enjoy. Amen. Only Jesus has authority over the tempests. Only He can restore calm. You know, a drug dealer doesn't generally follow a well-thought-out, carefully-researched 
decision process and conclude that dealing illegal substances with all of its inherent risks and negative societal impact is the best career path for him or her to pursue. That's not how it usually goes down, is it? Similarly, most normal people don't decide that the surest way to leave a strong moral legacy and bring honor to their family, friends, and God is to become a thief or a murderer. And Mary Magdalene didn't wake up one morning and make the decision that she wanted to be a prostitute. Perhaps like so many who eventually find themselves on a similar path of degradation. She was abused. Perhaps she was abandoned as a child. Circumstances which, although not of her own choosing, have nonetheless led her to this overall moral decline. Whatever the underlying cause, what we do learn from the details provided in the scriptures is that Jesus has seven times cast out demons that have been tormenting her driving her deeper down that spiral of sin. At some point, as it always does, the dabbling with Satan has resulted in actual demonic possession. And then we see that iconic moment when Jesus stoops to write in the sand, choosing to love rather than condemn, choosing to restore and empower rather than to execute judgment, and then aren't we just so incredibly blessed to see glimpses of the new Mary now in the process of being recreated by the patient work of the Master Restorer? You can see her, Mary, sitting in rapt attention at the feet of Jesus. Mary, boldly and unashamedly declaring her love and loyalty as she pours costly oil on his dusty feet and bathes them with her tears. Mary, joyfully welcoming her resurrected brother Lazarus from the tomb. Mary, one of only three of Jesus' close followers to actually witness the crucifixion. And Mary, the very first human to see our risen Lord on that triumphant morning. He had done precisely what Jesus had solemnly foretold that he would do. Only a short time earlier, and with typical Peter boldness, he had fiercely promised to stand loyally by his friend and master's side no matter what. Instead, along with the rest of the disciples, he had fled in terror when Jesus was arrested in the garden. He had then managed to overcome his fears just enough to sneak back without being noticed into the area surrounding the proceedings at least he thought he hadn't been noticed. Soon after, to his gut-wrenching shame, he had profanely denied that he ever even knew his Lord. Many days had passed since then, but his cowardly act of betrayal still felt like an anchor which was dragging his heart into the depths of despair. Jesus was alive. Mary and others had seen him, he too had viewed the empty tomb. And now Jesus was going to meet them at the lake. Mary had even said that the master specifically asked Peter to be there. Oh, he longed to see Jesus again. But at the same time, Peter had to admit to himself that he, that he dreaded facing his Lord after having so completely failed him. However, when Jesus did draw Peter aside at Lake Galilee, it was not to berate him as we in similar situations would be so likely to do. He did not say, How could you have done such a horrible thing to me, Peter? I thought you were my friend. None of the others went so far as to disavow even knowing me. I asked you guys to pray with me, but you had to sleep instead. If you will remember, Peter, I, I told you ahead of time that you would do this and, well... This is exactly what happens when you don't listen to me. No. No, Jesus never said any of that. Nor did Jesus assume an air of righteous indignation 
Oh, you and I, we're pretty good at doing that, aren't we? You see, Jesus wasn't interested in asserting just how right he was. And he's right all the time, by the way. He was only interested in restoration. He was intent on empowering Peter to become just exactly what he went on to become. A dynamic soul winner, a a leadership anchor for the early church, a life-giving agent of restoration and healing. The truth is, there is not one single person in this world who doesn't need restoration. And there is not one single person in this congregation who doesn't need restoration. We've all been broken. We've all been damaged in one way or another. Without the patient and healing hand of the Master Restorer, all any of us can ever hope to be is a rusted out, misshapen, ugly, sin-infested piece of worthless junk. It is my fervent prayer that every one of you is fully convicted by this pivotal truth. So now please turn in your Bibles to Zechariah 3. We are going to read verses 1 through 4. Zechariah 3, 1 through 4. If you'll follow along, I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation. I'll wait for you just a moment while you find it. And I have to tell you, this is one of my very favorite scriptures in the Bible. Are you ready? It says, Then the angel showed me Yeshua, or Joshua in Hebrew, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser, Satan, was there at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Yeshua. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusations, Satan, Yes, the Lord, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. Wow. Snatched from the fire. That sounds like restoration to me. Yeshua's clothing was filthy as he stood there before the angel. So the angel said to the others standing there, Take off his filthy clothes. Turning to Yeshua, he said, See, I have taken away your sins, and now I am giving you these fine new clothes. Now, friends, this is a beautiful story of restoration. And more than that, this is the good news of the gospel. Filthy clothes become clean clothes. You see, the gospel isn't the Sabbath, it's not the beasts of Revelation. It's not our dearly cherished, highly vaunted health message. All of that is biblical, and it is true. And I'm thankful for each and every one of those truths because they represent discipleship and and they more fully reveal God. But, and this just might shock you, that is not what the world or the city of Missoula or your community is dying to hear. But this is. Filthy clothes become clean clothes. Isaiah 64, 6 is very succinct when it says, We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like Joshua in that story, I have no desire to stand in the presence of a pure and holy God clothed in my disgustingly soiled righteousness. Anybody else feel the same? Yeah. Praise God that our righteousness, our filthy rags, can be removed and replaced with the pure white robe of Christ's righteousness. Amen. Please don't ignore something about this story. Joshua in this story is the high priest. His clothes weren't any cleaner because of his position. So don't think that because you have served time as a deacon or as an elder 
or you have worked at the conference, or you've taught the Sabbath school lesson, or you always make the most popular dish at potluck, or you have been regularly supporting God's work with your faithful tithes and offerings, don't think that you don't need restoration, because we all do. In fact, if you worry about this fellowship ever growing, or being able to keep and maintain its members, or have an impact in the community, then this fellowship and you need restoration in a big way. Now there is sadly an antidote to restoration. Do you know what it is? It's pride. You see, Jesus doesn't force us to love him. He doesn't force us to follow him or accept his restorative work on our behalf. Do you know what he does? He stands at the door and he knocks. This antidote, pride, prevents us way, way, way too often from opening that door. It prevents us from surrendering our lives fully to him. And it prevents us from submitting to his healing and transforming power. But if you will confess your pride and honestly see your filthy condition and open the door to him, he will begin and continue that wonderful process of recreation in us. And you and everyone in this fellowship can live that rich, abundant, restoration-bestowing life which he has promised to us all. Do you want that? Yes. Amen. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. But wait. Wait, wait, before you do. I don't want, to, I don't want you to raise your hand if, if you're just tired of hearing me talk and you're starving and you can't wait to eat lunch, right? No, I don't want you to do it then. I want you to raise your hand if your heart desires to be freed from the inhibiting chains of pride. And raise your hand if you realize that this fellowship, just like all churches, is not about bricks and mortar. This fellowship group is about us. It's about you. It can only be truly healthy and alive in Christ if you are healthy and alive in Christ. Amen. Let's say a prayer. God, we just are so grateful, so grateful that you made it possible for us to have clean clothes. Amen. That you came down here so that you save us from this gunk. We have a plan to restore this broken world to eradicate sin once and for all. God, forgive us for thinking that we can do any of that without you. And help us now, Lord, to, to recommit that we will surrender ourselves fully to you. I ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.